at something real quick. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, that's one, probably good. Instead of holding it. I don't, I, now, how long roundabout? Is it? Uh, uh, ten minutes. Five, ten yeah, minutes, great, Max. Great, 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 great. great, great. Uh, I love it. Okay, this is a nice little spot. Here, uh, that is better than just holding it already. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Great, fantastic. Okay, so try to center yourself up there. Put your face right in the middle. Of the, there you go. Great. Here we are. Okay, I see you. Okay, I see you too. Thanks, That's sir. fantastic. Okay, so we got Master Sergeant High Mailspin on here. And uh, are you, are, are you, um, how, how, how long have you been engaged down there without a break? Yeah, well, I didn't see my family at or home for the first 48 days. I counted it. Um, it, it, it was quite intense, but then I was released to for a weekend here, a weekend there. Um, and, but there are those, uh, you might call me the more spoiled ones. Uh, there are those who are combat who haven't even gone home at all yet since the 7th of October. And, uh, you can probably hear the explosions a bit behind me. Um, but yes, it, it's definitely, uh, I'm here at Gaza border right now. Um, just on the, on the Israel side right now, but, uh, there are those who, uh, drive tanks. There are those who fly planes who are just called upon constantly. And, uh, and I just, I, I feel for them. Frankly. So, so give us an update. Give us a sense of what what you've been seeing and what it's like in there. We hear that outgoing fire there. Uh, so obviously, the uh, artillery is taking it to uh, Hamas in Gaza, taking it to the terrorists. So uh, tell me, tell me what you've been seeing and and what's like. Yes, uh, and I'm very honored as well. Just that the army's even called upon me, and they said, "Look, you speak English, and a lot of people don't speak English, and so and you you're able to convey a message. Just stick with the uh, rules of international media, and don't don't release any secrets uh, uh, that you shouldn't release. But talk about things that are that are on the news and available to speak about. So that is uh, what I'm doing. Um, and I'll just say, even where I'm right now, just just to even give you a picture of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, so right here is the entrance to Woods Barry. So Barry is right on the border. Uh, there you've been here. And uh, there's, there's a, imagine you're here for a Shabbat dinner in a peace-loving kibbutz. I mean, everyone here loves peace, sings about songs of peace. Even the way we say hello in Israel is shalom. That means peace. We say peace one to another. That's our tikva, our hope is just to dwell in peace. So you're here for a Shabbat dinner. Suddenly, violent, barbaric, uh, murderous people come through here and try to kill you. And you run into this little... Bomb, bomb shelter is stuck right now. now. We're so glad as a charity to be able to help in various ways, as well as a sergeant major in the combat engineer corps. We help, but so this this was a, a bomb shelter donated here, and then look at the RPGs hit bullets, and you run in there, and inside you'll see sprayed up with a uh, machine gun to death, and that's your story. How horrible would that be? I think people are quick to forget. That's why I even sat right here as we're doing this, just to just again. Remember what is going on. We can't have that happening to us all the time. We, I personally fought against the Hamas. And let me throw another story at you, at you real fast. My own mother, okay, I made Aliyah some 25 years ago almost. And in two, year 2000, there was something called the Antifada. I hear people are chanting Antifada without knowledge. A Antifada was for me. I, we're trying to go to, uh, she was going to a cleaning job. We had no money as immigrants. We still have no money. <laughs> But um, we went, she was going to a cleaning job and she goes uh, on a bus to go, to go clean. I'm on another bus going to a cleaning job myself. I worked at anything I could get as an English speaker that just came and I didn't come with money from America. And, uh, and so I hear a loud explosion. I look at the bus driver, this year 2000, and he looks back at me and he says, wow, that sounds like a very big explosion. I said, let me out. And I run through the streets and I cut through the alleys and I see a bus blown up. It's bus number four in Tel Aviv. And that's the bus my mom takes to work. I had just said goodbye to her. We had a sandwich. And then I start digging through dead bodies, blown into pieces. The driver was hanging out the window. His body was lifeless out the driver window. All the windows are... This is year 2000. It's a long time ago. Who did that? The Hamas did that. The Hamas did that. And, uh, and they taught their people. This is the great thing to do. They put the pictures of those who did that. Uh, either, I think they left a bag there. Good news. To wrap up the story, my mom had missed her bus. She had oh, missed wow. her bus. And, uh, but even though saying, you know, as someone who 
is a, I'm a Zionist. I believe in God. And I, and I think, you know, can, can I really say God saved her, but then let everyone else die? It, it's a conundrum. It's a conundrum. Point is, she did survive, though. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a theological conundrum. How do we handle But that's it? the kind of thing that you guys have had to put up with uh, from, from the day, first day you got there. And, uh, yes. I mean, it's obvious God wasn't finished with her yet, so he still had something yeah. for her to do, and he's had something yeah. for you to do. So how, how, what kind of risks have you had to face? Because you're in an engineer unit, so you guys are dealing with the tunnels. Uh, what, what have you seen regarding the tunnels that you can tell us? Yes, my, my service started out with the first 20 days, we were ordered to clear all this kibbutz area. So it started out really bad, seeing tons of bodies clearing. Whoop, somebody's calling you. Oh, what happened there? Sorry. Right, that's right, somebody's calling you, it's all right, so that, oh, that's okay. okay. At the beginning, Whoop. first 20 days, we received an order as Combat Engineer Corps unit, which we deal with explosives. We're called upon to remove uh, uh, explosives. A lot of the bodies had explosives on them or rockets or RPGs, or they were even booby-trapped. So when someone comes to move a Jewish body or something, they blow up. So there's a lot of this stuff uh, because their force uh, is, a, is a really strong force called the Nukba force. It means they're very highly trained almost like like a, a, an elite unit in Israel, the way the training they had, which was surprising for us. Um, so that was our first 20 days is bodies, bodies, bodies. I, I developed a cough from uh, breathing in too much uh, dead, rotting uh, air. air, And so I started coughing. They said, you'll be fine. And the, I went to the doctor and said, you'll be fine. That was my first 20 days. Then they said, all right, you're going in now for 60 more days, which is we're, re we're getting near uh, the end. 60 more days, you're going to go in and you're going to remove Hamas infrastructure and you're going to remove, you're going to join all the rest. And your big thing is going to be special tactics. For example, mapping and destroying the tunnels, high stakes hostage rescue. Um, for example, a house is, you need to go in, not through the door, blow a hole in with your explosives, do, do all kinds of, remove this, remove that missile launcher. There's a laboratory of explosives. You go deal with that. Don't just have a soldier pick up some grenades and, uh, or not grenades, some uh, TATP, TNT, Compound B, some stuff like that. Don't let them touch it. They might blow up. It might be, uh, what is it, mercury switches. Watch out for, uh, there's various, uh, even, what is that called, nefach, where you move, uh, motion sensor activated, telephone activated, tripwire activated uh, explosives. So that's where we're called upon in the battlefield to do that. We have, we work with the bomb dogs with Okets unit, which is the, the explosive smelling dogs. They'll go in and they'll help us a lot, but we have other ways of trying to protect life. If you've seen the movie Hurt Locker ever, that's a really good movie to, to watch, to understand me specifically and what we do as Yalom unit. Hurt Locker, it's called. It's a great movie. Right, right. So um, uh, I, here's a question that a lot of people have been asking that I think is safe to ask as, as far as OPSEC goes. Um, they're just wondering what happens to the bodies of the Hamas fighters that are killed? Do they have people who go around and pick them up or they just leave them lay? Well, they, they first removed the Jewish bodies uh, of all the, the innocents and got them to, to burial. Then the, those were left there longer. Uh, then they were also removed as well. So now you'll see no bodies. If you go through, you'll see pretty much none anymore. Whereas people, you couldn't walk from one side of the queue to the other without just stepping over hundreds and hundreds of bodies of various, right. uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. That's a lot. And you yeah. just step over and blood. That's how it was when the first uh, 80, uh, 80 uh, journalists were brought in. The very first. Yeah, that was, I was in that group. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah. So, but, but what I'm asking specifically is in Gaza, in the fight there, in, in northern Gaza or whatever, they blow up, you know, a building that's got a bunch of Hamas guys oh, in it. Do they just leave them or what? Yeah, at this point, they're not, yeah, they're just right now waiting for their, whenever their family or whatever comes and gets them. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't have any burial for them. Of course, okay. our soldiers are coming out. Our soldiers of course. are hurt. And, uh, right, right. One of the guys you yeah. One of my guys you may know sleeps right next to me. He was just all over the TV because he was in a firefight. He got very, very badly injured. Um, and so what he, in the video you see him, uh, two terrorists are shooting or more, are shooting at him. He gets blown back by a grenade, but he just keeps on handling the situation with precision. That's Yalom uh, working with precision. I'm very proud of him. And right. Oh, yeah, that, that's amazing. I saw that video. 
And guys, if you want to see that video, I just uploaded it to my locals page. Go over to chuckholton.com and you can see the video he's talking about. That guy's a stud. He got wounded by a grenade and still fought on and killed those two terrorists. That was amazing. Did you notice he didn't even cry? You see blood in the video a little bit. He didn't even yell or like, ah, nothing. He just kept on driving for contact, not trying to escape. Uh, it's, it's a good example of what Yalom fighters are and he sleeps in the tent my same tent with me now right wow. now he's in the hospital but he's yeah, in the same of course. tent if you is he gonna be okay he will be but he's very badly injured yeah he's, oh, is he? he's probably he's gonna sit the rest of this war out uh, oh wow it's, <laughs> wow i'm he, sorry to hear that but so, so other than Gaza, of course is the sea the sea water it's become very famous i'm part of the command of the uh of that operation with the various lines to and to, to answer even your question you haven't asked it but Will hostages be flooded out, you know, is, is a question people ask. If the hostages are in the tunnels, and we believe they're still alive. We do believe and have hope that the hostages are still alive. Um, well, here's the thing. It's not immediate. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it built up because there's a lot of tunnels and what's connected to what. How big is the, is the expanse the, um, that needs to be filled? And so they have plenty of time to go out the way they came in. It, it fills up slow. Now, the, the way it could fill up fast is if they close these... Um, um, blast doors that they right. have they want has to hurt us and, and there's these blast doors now if it fills up on the other side and they open a wrong door that could be a quicker filling which is a little bit of a worry for hostages but if they notice water is coming they have plenty plenty of time I'm even days even weeks maybe to get out of the way and bring the hostages out of the way if they wanted to kill the hostages they kill them right now but if they want to keep them alive and they see water filling they can easily move them anywhere Right. But, it, but what it's going to do is it's going to remove that option for the leadership that's hiding down there. And so that's good. Now, uh, I saw a, a couple of commentators on the Internet who have not been to Israel and normally have no idea what they're talking about, saying, oh, this is so stupid because obviously all of these tunnels are compartmentalized. They're not connected. Uh, they're, they're not interconnected. That water won't go anywhere. Uh, what do you, you've been down there. What do you think? Are, they, are the tunnels mostly interconnected? Well, that's the thing. There's different types of tunnels for different types of purposes. So just even even that will help you to get your handle on it. One, if it's an attack tunnel, it's probably not so interconnected. It's just there's an attack tunnel that will go. It'll have a weapons area, mm -hmm. and then it'll have a location, and then it will go straight into wherever our troops are or Israeli border. There's even ones, as you may know, that cars can drive in with those uh, ISIS-type uh, pickup trucks, Hamas-type pickup trucks. White one, they can drive in there and they can drive right out. Now, there's they can come to try to hurt uh, Israel and blow up a fence. And that they had, I don't know why they didn't use those actually. Uh, in the actual October 7th, they just broke the fence and walked through. They almost all the tunnels weren't used on October 7th, but of course, we've been waiting to deal with them and we didn't want to be sure they won't use them um, next next time around so what i was saying is that that uh there are this that kind of tunnels and attack tunnel then there's a logistics tunnel where it's like getting all your your uh, you have like um comms and you have uh computers and you have a logistics you have tunnels with elevators in them like like kind of mm -hmm. to to cut across the the to different parts so what type of tunnel is it is it a logistics is it a preparation tunnel is it an attack tunnel not all of them are connected but there okay. are some that are connected. Um, a lot are not connected, though. Yes, a lot are not. Okay. And that, that I prefer, but a lot are not, but some are. That's good. That's good. Okay. And um, so the, 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 we keep seeing weapons, explosives, booby traps, and ambushes fired from UNRWA schools and mosques and you know yeah. training centers found in mosques and stuff uh what what percentage of the buildings in gaza that you guys are finding would you say are booby trapped or militarized in some way yes okay okay uh this is a very good question very good question and i'll tell you why i i wish and i'm sure you wish and i'm sure everyone that hears this wishes that every building that is hamas building would be painted with a hamas flag in green and black and red and you see it right there. There is a Hamas youth building. This one is not a Hamas youth building. This, this one's a kindergarten. This one's a UN school. This one, these are not Hamas buildings. Don't touch these. You only touch these. I wish that was the case. But the reality is not that 
reality is fighters are shooting you from every window. You're walking and you're being shot from potentially any any window. And it happens that has nothing to do with where Hamas had a uh, infrastructure. They jumped into, now they had this ready inside schools, under schools, tunnel threats that they can come out of. Now, is a, is a UN, I'll, ask, I'll turn the question back in a Jewish way. Is a building that's a UN school that has a tunnel under it, which I've been in personally myself, and we just got it leveled. We just blew it up. A UN school blown up, which sounds horrible. It sounds horrible coming out of my mouth. But you tell me, a UN school that has tunnel entrances and tons of weapons in it, is it a Hamas building or not? Well, of course it is. I mean, yeah, it's militarized. It's a legit military target. Now, let's just say a kindergarten for children. Now, the children have left. That has a tunnel. I personally filmed one of these myself. I found one. And I, this is one of the ones I personally, because it's funny. People say, how can I believe you didn't like place the guns there yourself? I'm like, okay, so I go there. And I go in there under fire, under lot of fire. And I go in there and I film with the GoPro. And, you know, I'm not even a spokesperson for the actual army. I'm, I'm a soldier. I just know English and, and God's put me in these positions. So I go in there and I film, look, there is where a tunnel entrance came into a kindergarten mm-hmm. with ABC. What is that? Is that a Hamas building or not? So the whole point is, it, it all be, it all, in various levels, is used as a place to to shoot from the windows. It's used as a place for, to rocket from. As the line progresses, they keep using mm-hmm. every building, irrespectively of any purpose. Some have been planned to use, which we're talking about planned ones, but others are just used. The force went in there, and they're shooting from this window. They're shooting from that window. And then you're like, hey, b- blow it. And so the Air Force, boom, hits these, these thank God they, the civilians have left. Right. But there's civilian houses, which are totally civilian, even without a tunnel, which have been used as assault and are now blown to smithereens. Very sad, very sad. Amazing. Affair. Yeah, it really is, but because that- it's going to take forever for them to rebuild that and make it a livable <laughs> place again. Uh, and, of course, the U.S. taxpayer is probably going to be on the hook to do that. Uh, some people are asking... Uh, if any of those tunnels that you know of went under the border into Israel. Yeah. Oh, definitely there are some. For sure, 100% there are some. One one personally, I was at the the crossing, the Erez crossing, which is one of the crossings, which is for to help them get jobs and to help them. People almost forget. Oh, the every single, this crossing point, let me just quickly say this. I'm there in the Erez crossing. I saw where the bloody bats were after shooting a ton of people, beat girls, uh, to death, to death with a with like this this club all filled with blood. It's still there. And they dated now these girls, computers. What are they doing on computers? Are those are those Israeli apartheid computers, terrorist computers? No, they're saying so and so has been checked. So and so is not doesn't have a bomb. So and so Mohammed El Raisi whatever is going to come through and work. Hundreds of thousands every day come and work, get more money than they get there, and they work and they meet with us. We give them sandwiches. Hey there, Palestinian worker. Ha, did you did you get a food today? Yeah, come on. My brother was uh, building a house in t- uh, building a house a the Sarona Center, the Sarona big center. He had fifty Palestinian my brother, fifty Palestinian workers under him, and wow. they wanted to work. And great money, and it's, it's grunt work, kind of like lifting cement. I used to do it myself. Nothing meaning every construction worker you call that demeaning. They won't. They're like it's an honorable work to to lift cement and to do stuff. My brother. Too. I was doing it two years ago when I made my Ollie. I was telling you, I was cleaning houses. I was doing whatever jobs I get. So they cross in. Those are the people to blow up first, to go and beat them to death. And those people that are typing your name to help you have a job. And who else is doing that? Is Egypt doing that, giving you a job? Is Egypt typing your name? Is, is uh, I, no, no, no fight here with Egypt. But, you know, is, is Jordan doing that? Is no. anybody else do, we're doing that? And these girls, these cute, nice girls who were killed and murdered, were doing that all day long every day as their job. Helping those people out. And blew them up with grenades. And uh, anyway, that's the fact. So my point is to to answer your question. Yes, in the eras, there was was way tunnel to go into Israel, also into other places, also from Lebanon, too, just so you know. There's tunnels that definitely I've seen that go right in under, like, kibbutz in Matula area. You've mm-hmm. probably seen them yourself. So from mm-hmm. both sides, definitely cross over. Yes, absolutely. These tunnels, that's what an attack is used for. Wow. So um, there are still quite a few civilians in the north, even though you've been telling them to leave for more than a month. And um, 
they so two questions why do you think that anybody is staying up there number one and number two are those people getting any kind of help medically or water or food from the idf yeah well there's that's a part that i don't actually know uh, in most of my person again my personal times throughout you know, the bali area area all the northern part that i've seen i rarely saw anyone very Whoop, locked up. Oh, I lost him. Whoop. Well, let's see if he comes back on. We'll just wait a minute. This, uh, folks, this is Heim Mailspin. He is a uh, sergeant major in the um, IDF the Special Operations Engineer Unit that is uh, s tasked with finding and demolishing the tunnels. And uh, it, we'll see if he can make it back on. But uh, he is coming to us from the border with Gaza. He just kind of stepped out of Gaza and he's right near the kibbutz Be'eri. There's a logistical support activity there. And he's, he's there uh, taking a breather for a few minutes. Let's see if he just got a hold of me here. Uh, yeah, he's... He's trying to see if he can get back on. Uh, nevertheless, what an awesome interview. Uh, Chaim is uh, a amazing, he's an amazing guy that I met and interviewed before the invasion started, just shortly before the invasion started, and had, a, had an amazing interview with him in person. And now I'm back in West Virginia and Chaim is there just outside of Gaza. We'll see. Uh, we'll see if uh, he can get back on. Uh, nevertheless, it's uh, it's really amazing to have him on and be able to listen to, you know, his firsthand experience of what's going on inside Gaza. Uh, there is a lot happening, and I'm going to be doing a live stream in about. Uh, 30 minutes on CBN's webpage. Uh, <clears throat> we are going to, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about an update on the war. We've got some, we've got a lot of things to talk about because there's been a lot happening uh, while I was flying back. Um, let me see here what level he's on. Okay, let's see. Hang on a second. Okay. I'm trying to chat with him here and see if we can work this out. And, uh, see if he can come back on. Anyway, uh, like I said, we had a uh, easy trip home. It wasn't too difficult. The the worst part about the whole trip, there he is. Hey, okay. I was just worried I'd lose it. I got traumatized from the t time. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I think we're good. It says seventy eight percent. So it won't stop until I stop the recording. So I got back uh, on. Okay. So real quick. Um, how can people pray for you and your soldiers out there in the field? Definitely for alertness. I'll tell you what my commander, the commander of the Yalom unit, talked to me the other day and said, you know, you, we're not used to long wars. Here's a little joke. Uh, the Six-Day War was only five to seven days long. And yeah. uh, you know, so 
the six day war. And so then you have the 73 war was just uh, 19 days long mm -hmm. uh, in the um, 73 war was the was the Yom Kippur war. And uh, and so you have these different wars that are kind of the war of attrition in what, 50, what was that? When the war of attrition happened, that was also long and drawn out in the Sinai Peninsula. But you guys got to be able to be alert, be awake. Don't don't get don't because you can make mistakes. You can tr go on a tripwire. You can uh, give a wrong order. You can really uh, endanger the troops if you're not awake and alert and not right. too tired. So pray for alertness, awakeness, wisdom, uh, divine intervention uh, for for just to know how to approach a, a situation like the one you saw yesterday. It completely, our troops were completely attacked with the Golani. Uh, ten soldiers killed. Uh, nine or ten soldiers with the Golani Brigade. They came in to rescue five other soldiers. And even those were were, you know, they thought. Yeah, they it was were an absolute. It was an absolute kill box. It was total ambush. Yeah, I saw that. It's incredible. And then you just pray for the people, for resilience for the people of Israel. Wives, kids. They're celebrating Hanukkah right now on their own without the dad. Same in my case. You know, and uh, and there, they, there are jobs and there is you're thinking, what is going to happen with my job, with my my life uh, when this is all over? And um, just pray for the families as well. And the trauma, the kids are, are sleepwalking into the bomb shelter, peeing their pants a lot of times because they just they're so accustomed to sleepwalking, hitting into things to try to get to the bomb shelter. When they hear the explosions, they're not even awake. This is trauma that lasts. And then, of course, losing a loved one. Comfort. Yes. Comfort you, my people. That's going to be a big thing going forward. And, you know, you mentioned about Gaza. I would say there's going to come a day where I believe the whole world needs to recognize what is called bad theology, what's called bad goals, bad parenting, and recognize, you know, because some people say, well, it's Israel's fault. So wait, wait a second, wait a second. Radical Islam in Nigeria, killing the Boko Haram and stuff, killing Christians. What did those Christians do? Yeah. What did the Christians in Nigeria do to be beheaded? What? What? Hundreds right. and hundreds. No, I, no one cares. I get that no one cares, but they should care and they should recognize the same thing as in the Taliban, the same thing as ISIS, the same thing as here with Hamas. So we need to have different goals. And when the world does rally to rebuild, I was suggesting that there should be some like someone else that's not a colossal corrupt uh, PA, Palestinian Authority, or not even F F FDLP or the uh, mm -hmm. or the PFL whatever, the Palestinian uh, Democratic, none of that. It should be someone like maybe MBZ or, or someone else, or maybe America should head it up, or, or maybe the United States should head up some sort of channeling investments from around the world and donations, two different things, portfolios, investment portfolios, and rebuild, and they'll get, they'll be the, who's the first to benefit? Well, the innocent Palestinians. Oh, so who's I was first? asking you, I was asking you, is the IDF helping the people that are stuck, that are still in the North? I, that's where we got yeah. disconnected. There's, I mean, if someone like you saw the girl, the four-year-old who was caught, if there's there's an innocent person or someone who surrenders, yes, it's surrender. They're going to be looked after. They'll just give them some food. But I mean, yeah, of course. Um, but it's not something that I personally witnessed a lot. I just have been. I've seen really no one but terrorists trying to pop out. Everyone else has been in my sphere that I've experienced has been. They've been all in the south. Okay. The, okay. You know, the, Good. Well, uh, tell you what, let me pray for you and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go. I'm very, very grateful to you, Haim, for coming on with me. There's, I've been getting so many questions. I have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people every day who watch uh, my, my lives. And uh, it's, to be able to hear from somebody that's right there on the front lines, it, it just kills me that they won't let me come in with you guys. But uh, maybe I told them if they, if they can set it up, I'll fly back over there in a heartbeat. So maybe I, I'll see you before too long. We'll see. And Jeff, could just last word is say, you know, this emergency aid initiative is helping not only the soldiers on the front lines with tactical gear and everything, heroes, but it's also helping families that have run from the terror and the rockets. And we got a lot of work to help Israel right now. And I think if anyone in the sound of my voice wants to help, the emergency aid initiative is some way that really is, and I'm on the ground uh, seeing it happen with our charity. Is that, is that through Aliyah Return Center? Yeah, it's part. It's the the initiative of the Aliyah Return Center for this time. Okay, so going uh, give me the give me the web uh, web page where people can yeah. go real quick. Yeah, so you can just go to even to Aliyah A L I Y A H Aliyah, which means the return, the prophetic return, uh -huh. uh, and the word return, and then center spelled like an American C E N T E R. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, dot com. And, uh, 
Com, and then you'll see there it says emergency aid initial fee. Okay. Yeah, I just put it in the I just put it in the chat so people that are watching live can can see it. Um, I love all right. Thank well, you. we love you, man. Uh, let me pray for you real quick. Lord Jesus, we're just so grateful for, for Haim and for the work he's doing uh, just to get the word out so that people can truly understand what's happening on the ground and not be uh, driven by every wind of rumor, or every, uh, every bit of propaganda, but, but just to hear from somebody that's right there, that's doing the, the fight in the fight. Father, we pray that you would send your angels to camp around them and rescue them and that you would give them discernment and, and peace even in the midst of the, the terrible, um, miserable conditions that they're in. Father, we pray for the families of those 10 men who were killed yesterday in that, um, that terrible uh, uh, ambush. Father, we pray that you would just be their peace and that they would cry out to you and they would find you, Lord. Uh, we pray um, for the safety of all of the IDF that are out in the field now and that this could be over quickly so that everybody can go back home and resume their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good guy, Chuck. All right. Thank well, thank, thank you, brother. Uh, all right. So I'm going to stop the recording, and you just don't hang up yet, and we'll fin let this thing finish up.